birds, the vintage telephones and modern day dinosaurs of our world. There are many different types of birds, and by and large, most of them will go on to do nothing of significance. Most of them won't even have names, awards, or a single bedroom apartment in downtown New York City. And that's because most birds are losers. The majority of birds are going to do what birds will do. Fly around while eating bugs and other animals' feces, stealing inconsequential things from people to give as gifts to other people, and acting as surveillance cameras for the shadow government while masquerading as living animals. But not all birds are incredible wastes of aerodynamic design and magnetic field generation detection. Some birds, like people, are better than all others, because some birds are famous. Today I want to talk to you about a goose who had the remarkable talent of being born functionally useless, and was ultimately saved from the slaughterhouse floor by a combination of a man who drives a tiny car and the wily profiteers over at a globally dominant sneaker corporation's marketing team. It's time to talk about Andy the Goose, the most plucky little duck who wasn't a duck. He was a goose, and damn was he an inspirational one at that. Oh, there you are. Hi. Welcome to my kitchen. I was just hanging out in the pantry, which I do, when the dishwasher turns on and I'm too scared to run by it so it doesn't attack me. In this holy house of culinary craftsmanship, I spend my time doing one of two things. The first is preparing delicious home-cooked meals, because cooking is extremely easy and absolutely everyone can do it without even trying. The second is heating up delivery restaurant leftovers, because I'm a busy, busy man who doesn't have time for anything except all the things that I have time for. So one day I wanted to combine those two things and started eating with Factor. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. And I am holding one right in my hand. Here it is. This is my actual dinner right now for tonight, and I'm not messing with you. I skip dinner to film this ad, and I dedicate myself to my work, and I'm very, very hungry, and I've got sun-dried tomato chicken that I'm gonna microwave just off camera and I'm gonna eat it because I suffer from a horrible condition known as being a cranky boy and it really flares up its symptoms whenever I haven't eaten. I put my factor meal on a plate and I just realized I'm gonna have to edit out and post the home of my refrigerator but I'm not at all gonna edit out my first bite it's pretty good well wow, that's actually pretty dang good for a meal that I just pulled out of the fridge and microwaved in two minutes, that's actually really nice. And I didn't even have to choose this specific meal. Factor lets you choose from 34 or more weekly flavor-packed meals that are ready in just two minutes. And also, are you like me? Super duper huge and large and the most important thing in every room that you walk into? Well, that might actually be because you're looking to cut weight. And Factor has a lot of calorie smart meals that will get you fed for 550 calories or less per serving. Head to Factor 75. You know, I should probably enunciate with the length of thing I'm getting paid for. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below to use code HUGBEES50 to get 50% off of your first Factor box. That's Factor75.com or click the link below to use code HUGBEES50 to get 50% off of your first box. I don't want to spill spinach on my bit. There we go. Factor, the best thing to eat when filming yourself in your kitchen doing a spontaneous mukbang for over a thousand strangers. The year is 1987. The Cosby Show is dominating the airwaves despite the fact its star is only a comedian on the side to pay for his passion project entitled Abusing Every Woman I've Ever Worked With. The Bengals walk like an Egyptian is wallowing in the forgettable accomplishment of topping the Billboard music charts, which is just going to act as a precursor to its real crowning achievement 27 years later of becoming the end credits song for the anime JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Stardust. Crusaders, and a goose is born on a farm in Harvard, Nebraska. But astonishingly enough, this goose has no feet. 
which is weird because geese often have not just one foot, but two feet. So this gosling not only shares a last name with Ryan, but is what Ryan would be if he ever decided to hit on any woman on the planet. Fucked. But somehow this immobile avian not only survived his disability that made him premium wolf food, he lived two whole years all the way into adulthood. Here now, Mr. Gene Fleming enters the scene. Gene was two things that are pertinent to this story. He was an inventor, and he was a shriner. A shriner is... Okay, so you, you know those old guys who wear the little tiny hats, the fezzes, and they drive around in their tiny little cars at parades? It's those guys. Now, they're apparently an old men's fraternity that focuses on charity and community work, but all I and the majority of people who are watching this video know about them is that they wear tiny hats and drive tiny cars. So I'm going to assume that that's all there is to know about them. The farm where the footless goose was born belonged to Gene's sister-in-law. And that's just where Gene so happened to be driving around his tiny car when he spotted the debilitated duck look-alike. He parked his tiny car, he got out, careful not to let his tiny hat fall off his head as he was walking through the field, and after studying the bird for some time, he said, I have an idea! And I like cartoon little cartoon light bulb appeared over his head, which we're definitely going to do in post because it's going to be very funny and make this story more realistic. Okay, so you may think I'm over-exaggerating a little bit about the whole Shriner hat and car thing, but I'm really not, because in an interview with People magazine, Gene told them that the only reason he decided to help the goose and kickstart this whole thing in the first place was because him being a Shriner gave him a natural instinct to help others. Gene scooped up the goose as well as its mate, and put them in his tiny car and drove all the way to his own farm in Hastings. He then started an 80s style montage set to the song Push It To The Limit from the movie Scarface that we really can't play right now because of copyright, so we'll be playing a different 80s styled rock song that sounds similar, but not too similar to that one. You'll really enjoy it. And anyway, in this epic montage of industry, ingenuity, and progress, Gene used his Spitfire engineering to try to get that goose to walk. First, he made a little birdie-sized skateboard and tried to get the goose to hop on it like those skateboarding dogs that sex-addicted men bring to the boardwalk every weekend to try to seduce women with. But it didn't work. Because common knowledge in the 80s was geese aren't nearly as radical as dogs, and Gene failed to collect all five of the letters in the word skate before the time limit expired. But then as Gene was pacing around in his workshop, he had a brain blast. How do I move around, he asked himself. The answer, of course, being his tiny car. But how does my tiny car move around, he reiterated. And after 48 hours of number crunching, he realized he used his feet to press the pedals. And to do that, you need feet. And what if someone used their feet to, instead of pressing pedals on a tiny car to propel everywhere they go, use their feet to actually propel directly off of the ground? Walking was the goal, and new feet were the solution. After taking a pair of leather baby shoes and stuffing them with foam rubber, Gene then took a hammer and smashed the bottom of the goose's stumps with the fucking prosthetics hard to make that motherfucker walk. And he did. In fact, he ran. He dashed, darted, dipped, dodged, but never ducked because he was a goose all around the farm. The goose got so antsy, Gene even made him a little goose leash for the goosey boy to walk around on walks, proving that he had finally become more radical than the dogs who needed skateboards to get pussy. Now that the goose was strutting its stuff, it needed a name to fit its new kick life in the balls by its own two feet attitude. Originally, Gene had named him Scarface to accentuate his tough as nails determination, but they couldn't get the rights to that name either, so they scrapped it. Then they tried Max but found that that name only increased his unshakable will and slowly began to make him too powerful. So they changed it before too much damage was done. Then they settled on calling him Andy because it's a cuter version of one of the strongest, most powerful names in human history, Andrew. 
Also, the real story is they named him Andy because Jean's 12-year-old granddaughter suggested it after she got into a fight with a classmate named Andy, but that story's really boring, and you know someone like Jean wouldn't get out of his tiny car or even take off his tiny hat for something so boring. Now let me ask you a question. How could this little guy not go viral? A cute animal like a goose given a second chance to lead a normal life? I'll tell you something about this story. If this was about a cockroach or a mosquito, no one would be able to give less of a shit about it, but geese thankfully just tipped to the aww oh, side of the aww oh, fuck scale. Which means by 80s standards, we have to do what social media does for us today. Turn this into a fluff piece to placate us while we distract ourselves from absolutely anything of merit going on in our lives. Gene had a buddy who worked for the local paper, the Hastings Tribune, named Gary Johansson. Gary allegedly got his flashbulb camera and his hat with the little card in it that said press and said what a scoop before writing a quick feel-good article and taking a photo of the new walking waterfowl. Accurately and hysterically, Gene knew that children are stupid. So when he was asked to explain how Andy got his name for the article, he totally disrespected and discredited his granddaughter for her stupid idea and said that the name of the goose was named after Andy Cap. The cartoon cartoon guy from Andy Cap Fries, and he did it because Andy Cap sounds like Handicap. That's really funny, and I'm jealous I didn't come up with that joke myself. And in a scenario very common for the modern man, a quick fling meant to make you feel good turned into a very big fucking deal. The story exploded across the world. People couldn't believe that this man not only owned a tiny car and a tiny hat, but he had a regular sized goose with tiny shoes. A Amazing. High-profile newspapers and international publications began contacting Gene's home hoping to get an interview, culminating in a full-page story in People magazine titled, A Footless Goose Becomes a Footloose Goose, which is pretty fucking good, and I will most likely steal that for the title of this video. But Gene was a stern man of solemn vows. He outstretched his arms and very slowly began ascending to heaven, and when he hit the top of his arc in the sky in a crucifix pose, he said, Sorry, you're all small time. I only talk to the big man! Which led to him walking Andy up on stage at The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in 1989. Now, I know television's a thing of the past and no one cares, but this is actually a pretty incredible accolade, usually reserved for whatever celebrity wasn't busy at the time, or... No, actually, that's kind of it. But it was so important that I found this photo of them being on the show. I couldn't find any tapes or archival footage from the episode. Okay, what do you mean that people weren't furiously trying to archive each and everything that happened that was related to this goose? This is important stuff here, guys. Okay, this is 1989, so... Do you really, really think the Berlin Wall falling or the Tiananmen Square massacre is more important than a goose getting prosthetic legs? Really? The people need to know! And the people need to know this because according to articles about the episode, Gene took the time to debut a new pair of shoes for Andy that featured spiked cleats on the bottom. The cleats were there to give Andy extra height and grip so that he could finally mount his mate and get laid for the first time. No, I'm not making that up. Yes, this goose is a lucky bastard and everyone should be jealous of him. I want shoes that I specifically wear to have sex. That sounds almost as awesome as my own tiny car and tiny hat. But now we get to the biggest of boys. The time when Andy stops being known as Andy and finally takes the name Andruthocles, which is the most adult version of the name Andrew. Andy the Goose was offered a sponsorship for life from Nike. Each and every month, Andruthocles, who we'll just call Andy for short, was sent a brand spanking new pair of Nike's baby shoes. And in exchange, all he had to do was presumably not shit directly on them. I don't really know the demands you can make of a goose. The story continues, things are going well, and one day Gene's relaxing in his office, polishing the side of his tiny car while perfectly balancing his tiny hat on his head, when suddenly, a faint whisper rattles around in his mind. 
he hears a voice almost imperceptible, but it's certainly there. And it gets louder and louder and louder. And it plants an idea in his mind. All the way until... MONEY! He cries out loud as he puts his tiny car in gear and floors it out of the room at a whopping 7 miles per hour. And it was around here that Andy Mania took off! The entire town of Hastings was originally known for being the hometown of Kool-Aid, which is some sugary, shitty drink that no one's ever heard of, I don't know. But now it was rebranded to be the home of Andy the Famous Goose. Tourists flocked... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so funny. To Hastings to explode it with money just to take a picture with the bird that, if you think about it, really didn't do anything because all of this was Gene's idea. And speaking of Gene's ideas, he even modified the passenger seat of his regular sized car, which he only used to tow away his tiny car if it ran out of juice, with a goose sized passenger seat just so he could parade Andy around town. And then the Andy fan club sprang up, which carried all sorts of merch from t shirts to postcards to prosthetics that made your penis a disgusting spiral just like Andy's. Andy even started his own gaming channel where he played all sorts of great games with his equally hilarious friends and put it all on YouTube for everyone to watch. Wait, no, hey, wait, no. Did I... Is that a typo? No, oh no, that's... I did that. That was not Andy, that was me. And you can check out my new gaming channel, Hugby's Gamer Mode, right now by clicking the link in the description. Andy was, for real though, invited to make public appearances at parades, county fairs, and most importantly, disability awareness and advocacy events, which is a slam fucking dunk for marketing if you think about it. And that's the most important one because it really solidifies what was going on here. Andy was a role model for a lot of people. He was a pioneer of spirit and determination. Life dealt him a bad, unwinnable hand, and with just a little kindness from a stranger, he went on to live a life far more grandiose than any of his fellow fells could ever even comprehend. He overcame his handicap with wild fervor, represented a natural thirst for life, and inspired countless people to stand up to whatever challenges life could throw at them. On October 19th, 1991, someone decapitated Andy, ripped his wings off, and skinned his corpse before leaving it in the middle of a local park to rot in the morning sun. Oh. Andy's body was found by some locals of Hastings, who immediately called Gene. Gene went into a bit of a tizzy, almost forgetting to put on his tiny hat for the first time in a hundred years. And after inspecting his farm, Gene found regular human-sized footprints leaving the goose house on his property. And although the goose corpse was wearing the trademark sneakers, the fact that Andy and his mate were not on the farm, and Andy's mate in fact had completely disappeared, had sealed the deal. Someone had kidnapped and murdered Andy the Goose. The county sheriff, Greg McGee, spoke to People Magazine about what happened, and said he personally wanted to offer a bounty to anyone who knew who committed this atrocity. This made people a, a, a little upset. A, a, a wee bit miffed, a, a smidge peeved off at this whole news that they just heard, so they offered to chip in their own money to inflate the bounty. It reached the uh, paltry, insignificant sum of $21,000 in today's money when you factor in inflation. Gene also received thousands of cards wishing their condolences, their sympathies, and even one card that said, Hey man, sorry about your goose, but where'd you get your tiny hat and car? I just married one of those cartoon mice that you see in those old Disney TV cartoons, and I want to get her something special for our anniversary when I'm done consummating our marriage. Now you're probably pissed too, right? Upset thinking, who who would do such a thing? You gotta know who did this. You need justice. Okay, I'll tell you, but only because you asked me so nicely. The person who murdered Andy the Goose was, we don't know. Well, we do know, but we don't know, but I'll explain. 
Immediately following the incident, Jean's only leads were thin and dubious. Things were pretty bleak for answers, mostly because the culprit came down to the group that makes the best music and really good animal sacrifices. Satanists. But... <laughs> to me, that's really a cop-out, and most likely really incorrect. Especially since Satanic Panic was on the rise all throughout the 80s into the early 90s. You remember when people thought Pokemon was created by the devil, Dungeons and Dragons taught kids how to gay men themselves in real life, and if you rewound music, rock and roll records, it would have Satanic messages in them? It's the same time period. This just seems like what people wanted to say happened Happen because it conveniently fits all the puzzle pieces, even though the picture's absolutely incorrect. Now, I have my own theory on what happened that I didn't see anywhere something people had talked about or considered, but you're gonna have to wait till the end of the video for it and you'll see why. And besides, analytics say that if you watch this far into the video, you're very, very unlikely to stop now, so good on you for being cooler than every pussy on this website who clicked away because they got all sad that the goose died. <laughs> Gene buried Andy in his backyard, and his mate was literally never seen again, and was never spoken of again either. Gene was given a giant donated headstone, which I'll put on the screen now. It's the only picture of it I could find, so good luck trying to read it. Sadly, Gene never knew closure. While on his deathbed, he whispered to his family, You know, I'll never know who killed Andy, but at least I'll always have you, my loving family consisting entirely of my tiny car and my tiny hat. Wait, I had a granddaughter? But cleverly enough, Gene was a grandfather. And what most people don't realize is to be a grandfather, you need to have a grandchild. And lurking in the shadows was Gene's granddaughter, Jessica Fleming. Yes, the very same who originally named Andy and owned approximately zero tiny cars and hats. No, wait, 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 don't click away. I know you're gonna click away because she possessed neither a miniature automobile nor an itty bitty bonnet, but trust me, this part's worth hearing. It's now the far off future year of 2016, and Jessica Fleming, who has married and taken the name Jessica Corgi, which is far more adorable, but it doesn't matter, I'm just gonna call her Jessica, has begun to look into the case of Andy once again. Hey, she's even apparently making a movie about the whole thing, and she's got a stand-up comedy special about it planned later this year. Neat! Eventually in her search, she calls the former Chamber of Commerce president, Don Reynolds, who finally reveals the truth of who killed Andy the Goose. I'm going to read the exact quote from Don Reynolds now, and I hope you're ready because you can't unlearn this. About two years after the murder, someone from the sheriff's department called and said, well, we found out who did it, but we can't tell you. And we don't want to have any news release about it. We didn't know what to do. Finally, we donated the reward to our community foundation, which used it for kids projects. I was told it was somebody that was not responsible for their actions. Boo! Boo! What the fuck was that? Boo! Boo! What the f- Boo! I need a satisfying ending! Boo! Okay, okay, okay. There is a potentially good reason here. Typically in cases like this, the police department don't want to reveal the perpetrator's identity because at the time of the crime, there's someone who can't or shouldn't be held accountable for what they did. Usually this means one of two cases. The criminal act was performed by a child or a mentally disabled person. And in this specific case, the narrative leans towards the latter being the person who committed the crime based on all the statements I read. Now, mental health cases are incredibly unique and nuanced. I really can't comment on the capacity of someone acting under those conditions. It is entirely possible that this act was perpetrated by someone lacking empathy or suffering from some sort of disorder or episode. And that conclusion's viability will probably never be answered. But I do want to talk to those who think that a child did it, because that's what led me to my own personal theory as to what happened. Would a child really, really be able to sneak to the farmhouse in the middle of the night 
on their own and then have the capacity to open the goose enclosure, take him and his mate out of their cages, all without making enough noise to attract attention from anyone on the farm, and then absolutely disappear one of them entirely while decapitating, de-winging, and skinning the other? Would they have the mental fortitude to murder a town hero? I don't think so. Kids from Hastings were often quoted in articles about Andy talking about how much they loved him. The dude was a Nebraska folk legend. There is no way a child would be able to do any of that, or most likely could even bring themselves to do that. Here's what I think happened. And it's the excuse for many a wayward, pathetic attempts to act like a total dick and get away with it. It's just a prank, bro. What if there was a group of people, particularly younger, known to enjoy messing with things, having a general apathy towards goodwill, and doing stupid shit just because it's something to do? I am of course referring to... Teenagers. This to me sounds pretty likely. Some punk teenager, for one reason or another, let the geese out of their cages and then did teenager stuff, maybe kidnapped them and thought it'd be funny to take them to the park and hang out, maybe just opened the cages and left them open, maybe pulled them out to set them free as part of a prank. It doesn't matter. What matters more is that we get to the more important question of, but then how or why did they decapitate Andy and rip his arms off? Hmm. Pause and think with me for a minute. When does such a heinous thing usually happen? In fact, when does such a heinous thing usually happen and no one reacts to it? When does such a heinous thing usually happen and we often can't explain how it happened? How does such a heinous thing usually happen? Naturally. Why did no one suggest during this entire story that while the kidnapping may have been done by a person, the murder may have been done by an animal? Coyotes, gray wolves, foxes, black and brown bears all reside in Nebraska, and all of them have been known to prey on geese. Wolves and foxes primarily hunt nocturnally, and coyotes are often seen doing the same. Completely ignore the fame and lore behind this goose. Tell me, if you saw two geese one day, and then the next day went to back where you saw them, and noticed that one was absolutely mauled and the other went missing, what would you assume? Would you assume that some random person came in and obliterated and kidnapped the geese? No. I would assume that some creature came along and attacked and ate them. Want to know why Andy's head and wings and skin were missing, but his trademark shoes were at the scene of the crime? Because a canine predator does not want to eat prosthetic legs or trendy Nikes, no matter how fire and delicious they may be. Based on all the evidence I combed, I really, really think that's what happened. Someone, most likely a minor or someone they don't want to name and give the responsibility, opened up Andy's residence for one reason or another. A, a prank, a goof, wanting to say hi to Andy and forgetting to close the cage. Then Andy and his mate were attacked by a wild predatory animal. This could have been immediately and then they were dragged away to the park, or they were brought to the park by the person and then attacked by the animal. Or, even more simply, Andy was attacked by a wild animal and his mate fled to not get attacked by a wild animal. Andy's mate wandered off away in search of safety. Case closed, in my opinion. Sorry to spoil the end of your upcoming special, Jessica. I hope I can still get those VIP tickets you promised me for solving the case of Duck Duck Murder.